Good evening and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Julianne Worden and I will be your moderator this evening as we watch the beloved Rick Steves European special with Rick himself. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our holiday host this evening, Rick Steves. Good evening, Rick. Julianne, thank you so much for the introduction and thanks to everybody for tuning in this beautiful evening and getting into the Christmas spirit and we're going to do it by traveling around Europe. We're going to visit six or seven different countries. We're going to eat a lot of great traditional European taste treats, I'll tell you that. And I'm also going to get you up to date on a trip I just made in the last uh, several weeks in Europe. So thank you very much for joining us. And um, you know what I'm going to do is, man, I just feel like I'm doing my very best to look like a Hallmark uh, Christmas card here. Uh, this is so nice to be with you. And I hope that you're having a good holiday season and you've got your loved ones with you and you've got your favorite travel partners and your travel dreams all cooking up for 2023. Um, I'm going to be, um, well, I'll, I'm going to introduce you to all my little taste treats and so on. But first, I just have a little bit of travel business to cover with you because I was just in Europe and I had a great time. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes here just updating you on what I did in Europe in the last month. And then we're going to go to the Christmas show. But thanks for joining us. And uh, right now, I'm just going to um, share to you share with you the, the fun I had in this last month. Uh, we have a, a situation where uh, we are just selling tours like mad, and we've got all sorts of um, tours scheduled for next year. And we've got a thousand departures, and we got to make sure our guides know exactly what makes a Rick Steves Europe special tour special. So we did two guide mentoring tours. This is our new class of guides, the class of 2022. And uh, we took two groups, 20 in each, on a one-week tour. It was essentially our Heart of Italy tour. And I got to be the guide, and all the guides got to be the tourists. And we went around, and I just, uh, they're all professional guides, they're all established guides, but I wanted to make sure they know exactly what is unique about a Rick Steves tour. Here we are on one of the towers, uh, the fortresses overlooking the beautiful town of San Gimignano. And uh, we had one group for um, about a week. And then the next week we had another group. And uh, for me, it was just so much fun to get back to Europe uh, and be the tour guide and to visit our hotels and to find out how they've done through COVID and how things are going. This is our beautiful hotel Lancelot in Rome that we just know and love with our groups. We had a chance to go to some of our favorite restaurateurs. This is uh, Claudio who runs Il Gabriello in Rome. It's my favorite restaurant in Rome. And to check back in and just celebrate the fact that we are traveling on. This is Tara from our office and Francesca, our lead guide in Rome. And um, I got to get our guides together and just, ex just to demonstrate in person what I think is really important as a guide, as a leader, as somebody who's going to orchestrate beautiful vacations. And uh, that might be giving short histories that really have meaning and that are tight, that might be creating experiences. Like if you're going to talk about the local cuisine, why not give everybody a slice of wild boar sa sausage while you're talking about it? Gather around nibble on this and I'll tell you stories of the cuisine in Tuscany. Uh, we want to make the history and the art come to life. And you know, I love to build a Gothic cathedral out of 13 tourists. Here we have our guides. There's 13 of them at work here and the rest are watching on, but we've got six columns, six flying buttresses, and one amazing spire. And there we illustrate the skeletal support of a Gothic cathedral. And then when you take your group into that first Gothic cathedral, they nudge their partners and they say, isn't this a marvelous improvement over Romanesque? Imagine getting turned on by Gothic architecture. You can do it if you have a good tour guide. I just love this approach that we have with our groups called Orient and Disperse. Here we are in the town of Orvieto, and it's just great to come into town and then walk across the town, point out everything, and then turn people loose in their free time. It's just as important to have free time once you're oriented as it is to have the guided time. And when we have guided time, we want a guide that can bring it to life. I mean, imagine if you and your partner were wondering, you know, we're both going to die one day and we want to be buried together and we want a nice sarcophagus. Well, you go shopping to the sarcophagus store, I suppose. You find a sarcophagus you love and you notice the faces are not chiseled out yet because they don't know who's going to ultimately lay in that sarcophagi. So here you got uh, unfinished sarcophagus waiting for its purchaser. I just love to make the art tactile and the history tactile. It's, it's, we've got to feel, we've got to be there. We've got to 
ah, to find just the right slice of pizza to go is enough just to make even a tour guide all excited. For me, making the meal a memorable experience is a really important part of a tour. And I stress with our guides that when we're having dinner, we are working. This is the most important hour of the day for the guide is to make sure that the 25 people in their group know what they're eating, that everything is coming smooth and there's no anxiety and people are getting what they want. And we are having a cultural experience, a convivial social experience, and we're just enjoying a very appropriate slice of the local culture. It's talking about appropriate slices of culture, we were there on Thanksgiving and we had all of our European guides, almost all of our guides on these uh, mentoring tours were Europeans. And uh, our guide in Volterra, Annie, is an American who married into Volterra. And she invited us to a Thanksgiving dinner with all of the great ingredients from Tuscany and Volterra. And our guides sat down to an amazing Thanksgiving Italian feast with the biggest turkey we had ever enjoyed eating and just a delightful meal. Uh, I don't care what holiday it is. What I want for dessert is my vin santo and my biscotti, Italian dessert wine. And then you dunk your biscuits in that. And it is just a beautiful capper for a beautiful meal. Each day we would gather in a historic spot. I mean, this is our guides all gathered together in the city hall, the historic city hall of Volterra under medieval beams and chandeliers as we went through the nitty gritty of how do you make a Rick Steves tour a success? What is it about a Rick Steves tour that keeps our travelers coming back? And we had we had school on the road for these guides. It was like boot camp for tour guides. Uh, one thing we're trying to do is amp up the experiences in our tours. We Americans have the shortest vacations in the rich world. And uh, we did some examples, like we stopped by the American cemetery just outside of Florence. And uh, it's just an hour to, of our visit. And uh, we have a, a local uh, a, a soldier take us through who's, uh, who's, uh, you know, whose responsibility is to welcome guests and give us a meaningful experience. 4,000 American troops are buried there. And this is the memorial to the soldiers, the warriors who sleep in unknown graves. And when the when the when the attendant pulls out photographs of these soldiers, it's really a powerful experience. Another great experience we had was in Florence. We met Caterina, who's a flash artist, and that is just ad lib, spontaneous art. She whips up a few beautiful paintings, and then people get to try it. And here's what Tara put together in five or 10 minutes. And uh, we get a chance to actually make some art surrounded by all that great art in Florence. It's one of those experiences that we love to take with us. Uh, between the tours, I had a few days and uh, I really enjoyed updating my uh, audio tours for Rome. We have nine in audio, audio tours in Rome. And this is uh, Michaela. And Michaela is from a family that goes back 2,000 years, a Jewish family that goes back 2,000 years in Rome before the uh, diaspora. And uh, this is the oldest Jewish community in Europe, in Rome. And she is the leading Jewish guide in Rome. And I'm so thankful for my friendship with Michaela. And she took me around through the ghetto so I could update both the chapter and the audio tour and also gain an appreciation of those artichokes, which is a big part of the local cuisine. Christmas was approaching. Even the wild boar is going to be in the holiday spirit. And uh, of course, at St. Peter's, you've got uh, what must be the biggest Christmas tree I, I think I've ever seen, along with a massive manger scene right there in front of St. Peter's Basilica. Inside of St. Peter's, I noticed a little bit of leftovers from COVID. For instance, the pilgrims can no longer kiss the toe of St. Peter's, as pilgrims have done for well over a thousand years. Look at how worn down his toe is, but now it's cordoned off with ropes and people have to stand there from a distance. And that's one of the new hygienic changes we have in Europe, so we all stay as healthy as possible. I love this Cupid, this pudgy winged baby. I always make a little visit to say hello when I'm at St. Peter's. And I was just there and I looked at that baby and I thought, you know, I need to fly home because waiting for me back in the United States is the happiest, happiest Christmas present I could ever have, my grandson. There's Atlas. I flew back to Los Angeles and um, <laughs> got, to, got to meet little Atlas. He's six weeks old. My daughter, Jackie and Damien are just so proud. They've got this 
gorgeous little baby. Uh, Jackie lives in LA and this is her house. And it was so much fun to be able to visit. And uh, uh, Shelly joined me and we took some hikes and Atlas is already getting out there and enjoying the world and getting to know his Mimi and his grandpa. But there's my daughter, Jackie, and our little beautiful, beautiful grandchild, Atlas. Hey, I want to remind you, when I look at you know, a family that is so blessed and so privileged and so fortunate, especially around Christmas. Uh, all of us at, at uh, Rick Steve's Europe are mindful that a lot of people on this planet will never see their names on a plane ticket. And a lot of people have the heartache of a beautiful child without the wherewithal to take care of his health needs or her, uh, her special needs or education or whatever, a roof over their head. And every year uh, we, we challenge our travelers to help us out as we work to raise a million dollars for Bread for the World. Bread for the World is an advocacy organization. That means they lobby for hungry people in the halls of Congress. I've been supporting them for 30 years. And for the last five or six years, we've raised a million dollars. The deal is I challenge our travelers for up to $500,000. And if 5,000 people can give $100, I match it, I match it whatever level they give, and it totals a lot of money to empower Bread for the World to do their important work, more important than ever now, with the pandemic, with climate change, with the war in Ukraine and its impact on hungry people. And uh, I just checked in with Bread for the World, and uh, this this shot was taken a couple of years ago, uh, but that's Eugene Cho. He's the president of Bread for the World. And um, man, oh man, we've got 2,800 people right now who have given at least $100 for this annual fundraiser for Bread for the World to empower the uh, great staff at Bread to encourage our government to have policies that are friendly to hungry people. And that means we've raised over $600,000 when we bring in my match, and we are pushing for a million. If you want to learn more about that, I'll tell you later on how to do it. But a lot of people wonder how we can enjoy bringing you Monday night travel every night. We're celebrating our 100th edition coming up, I think, in a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, it's free. We're happy to do it. But if you feel like just a token of appreciation for all the joy we bring you with Monday night travel, one great thing would be for you to make my Christmas even more expensive by donating 100 bucks to Bread for the World. And then I will match your $100 and we'll make this Christmas a very special Christmas in ways beyond the little gifts under our own trees. Another thing I want to announce before we get into our Christmas show is for 22 evenings in January, starting on January 9th, I'll be hosting, along with my uh, partners here at Rick Steves Europe and other guides, uh, a series of talks celebrating each corner of Europe. Of course, we're selling tours, but each evening is free. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to feature guides in Europe and lots of information. And uh, you can see right there, every night, 6 o'clock Seattle time, 9 o'clock on the East Coast, we'll be going somewhere in Europe. That includes four Monday night travels. Every Monday, there's a special episode. And then every other night, we go to a certain region in Europe with a certain guide from that region and celebrate all the fun we have when we go over to Europe and enjoy it on our Rick Steves tour. So Julianne, that was my little report from the trip. But right now, we're all here to go to Europe for Christmas, I think. Yes. And my question, Rick, to start the show, a lot of the viewers, myself included, when they watch the Christmas show, get that warm and cozy holiday feeling. And I wondered, Rick, how does the Christmas show make you feel? You know, it's interesting. The Christmas show, Julianne, is something that's been running all over the United States now for like 15 years. And I never get tired of seeing it because I see the love of parents and their children. I just see little pudgy pudgy fingers making the cookies and decorating the trees. I see the the real meaning of Christmas, which is community and love and, and all of us recognizing that we're all children of God and we're in this together. Uh, I see uh, traditions. I, I'm just so thankful we were able to do a, a Christmas show that focuses on traditions and that focuses on that non-commercial dimension of, of Christmas. And what I like also is to celebrate the different cultures. I've, I've been enjoying Christmas all my life in different countries uh, from as far away as South America and, and South uh, Asia and, uh, and Japan and, of course, in Europe. And, 
you know, all over the world, people are in a good mood this time of year, uh, regardless of their religion or lack of religion. This is just a time that people recognize, hey, we're all family. We're all family. And uh, it's just for me a delight to be able to, to share my love of Europe and my love of Christmas together in a one hour package. So we did, you know, the challenge for us, uh, Juliet, was to uh, to shoot Christmas in one in one uh, season, in one Christmas, and uh, we had two crews going on, and we were running around like crazy, uh, showing it off. We were only actually in where we were. We were in uh, Switzerland and in Italy on Christmas Eve, uh, but we had two crews going. And uh, we have in Europe a long Christmas calendar. You know, it starts, well, Norway celebrates Santa Lucia Day. That's December 13th. And Christmas goes strong and strong all the way to Epiphany, which is January 6th. And that's a big deal in Italy. So, um, you know, this is just a joy for, for us to be able to share this. Um, I'm going to right now just remind people that we'll have Q&A at the end. But right now, I would just love to get into here. And shall we go and watch the show, Juliet? I think so. <laughs> all right, let's do that. Let me just, um, all right, thanks again for joining us and let's go to Europe for Christmas. Hi, I'm Rick Steves and it's Christmas time in Europe. From manger scenes to mistletoe, from Norway to Rome, we're celebrating all over the continent. Bon Natale, Fröhliche Weihnachten, Joya Noel, Merry Christmas, and thanks for joining us. In Melting Pot America, Christmas is celebrated year after year with traditions that came over on the boat with our ancestors. In this holiday special, we're traveling back to the old country, to places of rich variety and deep roots. We'll explore the history behind our much-loved traditions. Joining friends and families across Europe, we'll discover a Christmas that's both familiar and different. England is filled with voices singing in the season. The short days around the solstice bring Norwegians out to celebrate the light of Christmas. Families, friends, and food are the centerpiece of the French Noel. An angelic Christmas presence fills Germany and Austria with magical wonder. Italy reveals the sacred nature of the season from its countryside to its holiest shrines. Nature in all its wintry glory seems to shout out the joy of the season in Switzerland. And everywhere, Christmas is celebrated with family, including my own, as together, Europe remembers the quiet night that that holiest family came to be. While each European culture gives Christmas its own special twist, they all follow the same story of how the Son of God was born on Earth, as told in the Bible, and illustrated over the centuries by great artists. By the way, I just love this opportunity to look at the celebration and the traditions of Christmas through the great art. And you'll notice a lot of this art is set not in the Holy Land, but in Europe. And a big deal back then was to help people relate to this story by putting the scenes from the Christmas story right there in Italy or Germany or France or, or wherever it was painted. So we really had a, a fun time setting this up to sort of set the table, to, to tell the story before we traveled to each of the countries to celebrate it. The Christmas story begins with the Annunciation, an angel sent from God with a message for a young woman whose name was Mary. And the angel said, Fear not, for thou shalt bring forth a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he shall be called the Son of the Most High, and his kingdom will have no end. And it came to pass that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And Joseph, a carpenter from Nazareth, went to Bethlehem to be taxed with Mary, who was expecting a child. And while they were there, she brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger, because there was no room in the inn. In that region there were shepherds, keeping watch over their flocks by night. 
an angel of the Lord came to them and said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. For unto you is born on this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And suddenly there was a multitude of angels proclaiming, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill to all. And the shepherds said, Let us go to Bethlehem, where they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now after Jesus was born, there also came wise men, and a glorious star which they saw in the east went before them. Guiding them, it stood over where the child was. The wise men knelt down and worshipped the child, giving him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The long-awaited Messiah had arrived. So that's the Bible story. And what I wanted to do was also lay that over sort of an anthropological approach to uh, to the whole winter holiday season. So much of what Christians celebrate has pagan roots that were there long before there was any Christianity in Europe. So here's an example coming up of how much of what we celebrate in our Christian approach to the winter holiday Christmas was already there before the birth of Jesus. This, by the way, is a very long on camera back before I had any teleprompter. And I just, I just, it's so um, nerve wracking to try to get every word right when there's so much going all around us. But it was just really great to be over there sharing this information. This is the story that Christians have celebrated through the ages. We don't really know on which day Jesus was born. Historians argue it was likely in the spring as shepherds were tending their flocks. But in the fourth century, a pope declared December 25th to be the official birthday of Jesus. Why that day? Well, Christianity was newly legal in the Roman Empire, and the clever pope figured it would be smart if the biggest Christian festival coincided with the biggest pagan one, winter solstice. And throughout the land, people, Christians celebrating the birth of the sun and pagans celebrating the return of the sun have been rejoicing ever since. For scenes straight out of a box of old-fashioned Christmas cards, we head to England, to the city of Bath. Here in the heart of the old town, near the magnificent medieval abbey, Bath hosts an annual Christmas market. Carols are a deeply ingrained part of the English Christmas tradition. The custom goes back to Shakespeare's day. Today, young and old sing their way through the season. Here, the Bath Abbey Choir of Boys and Men are performing a carol concert by candlelight. So I got to I got to take just a moment here and thank the guides all over Europe that helped us put this together. It's just when you think about all of the people we met, all the concerts we went to, all of the kitchens we were in making the cookies and so on. These were mostly the homes and the help of our guides that that help us with our tours when we're around in Europe and our individuals that come to these cities. You'll notice in this show, in every culture, we go to a big city and we also go to a small town. 
And the small towns are where you really find these traditions so rich and there's so much going on. If you find yourself traveling in Europe during the holiday season, you'll find all sorts of markets, you'll find all sorts of concerts, you'll find people in the streets and everybody's just in a great mood and you'll have lots of good stuff to eat and drink. Let me, before we meet Maddie, who runs a beautiful company called um, Mad Max Tours out of Bath that goes to the Cotswold Villages and goes to Stonehenge and Avebury. I was just working with Maddie a couple months ago when we were finish, finishing up our art show because she helped us with the megalithic wonders around Avebury, but she's our go-to person in Bath. And we'll go into Maddie's home in a moment and make some figgy pudding. But while we're doing that, I'm getting hungry and I just want to introduce you to my food before I get going. And this is a hodgepodge from all over Europe. Uh, we're going to be going into Italy in a while. And in Italy during Christmas, they love their panettone. And here we have this Italian beautiful Look at that delightful Italian fruitcake. And what you do is you pop it into the oven and you toast it up, put some butter on it, and that's a beautiful treat. Uh, if you're going farther north to Norway, you're going to have some lefse. And lefse is like a potato pancake. And you smooth some butter onto it and sprinkle some cinnamon on there and you heat it up. And that's going to be a little taste treat in a little while. I have to have some savory dish. So I thought I would have... Uh, my favorite sausages uh, from Germany called the Nuremberg sausage, famously as big as your little finger. And you got three little sausages on a tiny bun with your mustard scent. And mustard is a big part of that sausage delight. And I'm going to be eating my Nuremberger sausages. Uh, back to Norway, I'm going to be having some krumkaka. And if you happen to have Norwegian heritage like I do, you have fond memories of a krumkaka. Every grandma makes sure their grandkids know what a good krumkaka is. And just eating that is Norwegian heaven, I'll tell you. Um, and I've got my cocoa because we're going to Switzerland. And in my cocoa, I've got some, oh my goodness. <laughs> I've got some peppermint schnapps. So, um, this will be warming us up as we go into the Alps. We were praying for snow and schnapps, and we got both of them. Yeah, makes you kind of want to yodel. Okay, we're going to go right now to England, and we're going to have some fun traveling through the Cotswolds on a Christmas time festival. As is the case just about anywhere, it's in the countryside that families celebrate Christmas in the most down-to-earth style. My friends, Maddie and Paul and their kids, Theo and Layla, are looking for a living tree, which they'll decorate and then plant at home. About the right size? Yeah, yeah. okay. Brilliant, I like it. It's a new twist on an old tradition, with a wink to the nature-worshipping pagans who once haunted these parts. Decorating with greens goes back to the Druids who adorned their temples with swags of evergreen. For pagans, living greens in the dead of winter represented the persistence of life. And for Christians, evergreens are a reminder of the gift of everlasting life. Mm. During this hectic season, getting together to bake Christmas goodies while the little ones decorate edible ornaments is a fine way for busy mums to enjoy some time together. Maddie's recipe for mince pies harkens back to the days of Henry VIII. Back then, the dried fruits, spices, and shredded meat for the filling were so expensive that only the wealthy could afford to make a mince pie. According to tradition, 12 pies should be eaten during the 12 days of Christmas to ensure good luck each month of the coming year. But it's the Christmas pudding that's the real centerpiece of a traditional English holiday meal. Like a lot of us, Maddie and Paul are opting for a simpler, less commercial style of Christmas, and that's reflected in their family traditions. 
Little Theos and Layla's wouldn't always have been so involved in the family activities. Childhood as we know it really began in 19th century England with the new middle class. And at Christmas, those stern Victorians gave themselves permission to Is indulge that? their children. Um, the English tradition of caroling starts very young. We're visiting Theo's school as the students take center stage at the 14th century village church for a very special Christmas concert. This, you know, Julianne asked me earlier, what, what's my fond memories of this show? Looking at these parents with their adorable little kids singing, here we go to Bethlehem, under, you know, the 800-year-old uh, rooftop of their little village church. It's just like our Christmas village celebrations, but without that long history. I mean, there is so much humanity to this, and we have so much in common. It's a beautiful thing about travel, and it's a beautiful thing about travel during the holiday season. Christmas is drawing near, and tonight, these lucky kids are taking a train through the woods to meet Santa, or, as the English know him, Father Christmas. Come on in now, now come on in and stand just there, and you stand just there, you come across there, that's right, and tell me your names. Now, what's your name? Dylan. Hello, and what's your name? Kate. And what's your name? Jack. Oh, well done. Now then, now then, most important, what do you want for Christmas? Just some surprises. I'm very good at surprises. <laughs> what do you want? Um, well, I haven't written my list down yet. Haven't you? So we're going to wait for your list, and when it comes, I'll be ready for it. Now, are you going to do something for me? Are you going to leave me something out on Christmas Eve? Yes. What are you going to leave me? Uh, Mixed pies and well, wine. Well done. And are you going to leave a carrot for the reindeer? Yeah, yes. Well done. Mince pies and wine. Santa has a different appetite in Britain than he has in my country. We'll check back with Theo and Layla on Christmas Eve. And what was your name, darling? Kate. And something special. Well, children on their best behavior ask Santa for the toy of their dreams. My wish right now is a chance to hear one of the finest chamber choirs in England, the 16, filling a church with timeless sounds of the season. By the way, I've made about 150 TV shows, and only one show have we paid for choral groups to work with us, have we brought an extra guy on the crew who's the sound man, and have we had this lovely opportunity to share sacred and traditional choral music and classical music, and then cut in beautiful scenes of the countryside as we enjoy the music. This is one of my favorite things about this uh, this beautiful Christmas uh, work that my staff did is that we have the music and the countryside woven together throughout Europe for this holiday celebration.
Leaving the tranquility of the English countryside behind, London offers Christmas fun fit for a queen and streets twinkling with joy. There's magic in the air, or is that snow? Here in Trafalgar Square, in the heart of the city, a winter wonderland has been created just for the day. It's a lovely snowy day, isn't it? Father Christmas has dropped by for the wintry fun, and London's town crier is in fine form as he passes out mince pies and holiday cheer. Nearby at Somerset House, once a grand palace, the courtyard has been transformed into an ice skating rink, elegant enough to make a commoner feel like royalty. At Covent Garden, shoppers can find classic toys for tots at Benjamin Pollock's famous toy shop, in business since the 1880s. The joy and peace of the Christmas season bring both people and countries together. This giant spruce, a gift from the citizens of Oslo, is a reminder of the friendship forged between Britain and Norway during World War II. And Norway is where we're headed next. Here in small town Norway, Christmas is celebrated with a unique intimacy and a Scandinavian flair for community. We're in Drobak, about an hour south of Oslo. While it's Norway's self-proclaimed capital of Christmas, Drobuk feels like any idyllic town on a fjord. Oh man, it was so great to be in Norway during Christmas. I want to remind you, travel is great in the winter. I was just there two weeks ago with our guides. And uh, the main thing is there's no bad weather, just inappropriate clothing. And when you're traveling in the winter, remember, you're not just running from the car into the museum or from the car into the mall or your house. You're out for hours at a stretch in the weather. So you need high top warm shoes. Uh, you need a, like a ski jacket and a hat and mittens and a heavy sweater and so on. And uh, remember that the days are short. Uh, we were in Oslo in, in Norway and it was dark by four o'clock. That's Alaska latitude, you got to remember. So um, get an early start and dress warm. And remember, if you're traveling during Christmas, on Christmas Day, most things are closed down. But other than that, things are wide open. And there's a lot of energy in the streets. And of course, all over Europe, they're trying to extend their, their commercial tourist season by encouraging people to come in the dead of winter for their markets. And they go find great markets everywhere. Hey, I've um, just finished my Nuremberger sausage. That was very good. And um, sorry, I had to jump the gun. We're going to Germany later, but I've had my German sausages already. Now I'm in Norway, so I just want to be more appropriate. I'm going to be digging into my lepsa. And, you know, lepsa is this very traditional pancake um, sort of flatbread. It's got flour and butter and uh, potatoes and milk in it. And then you, you can have it savory or sweet. I'm having mine sweet here. So I've uh, buttered it up. I've heated it up and I've sprinkled sugar and cinnamon on it. That's going to be great. And I think I'll wash that down with my krumkaka. And uh, the krumkaka is so much, just, it's so delicate. It's so fun to, mm, you just eat it like a, I don't know, you, you unroll it into your beautiful holiday season memories. Oh. And this is really done nicely. I'm thankful to have Norwegian friends. Um, all right. Well, um, I hope you're, um, having a, um, a culturally appropriate Christmas yourself. And right now, we're going to carry on in Norway. And remember, a big deal in Scandinavia is Santa Lucia Day. And that is December 13th. Let's check it out. It's Santa Lucia Day, December 13th, one of the darkest days of winter and an important part of the Scandinavian Christmas season. All over Nordic Europe, little candle-bearing Santa Lucias are bringing light to the middle of winter and the promise of the return of summer. Mm. These processions are led by a young Lucia wearing a crown of lights. 
This home has housed widows and seniors for over 200 years. And today, the kindergartners are bringing on the light in more ways than one. The children have baked the traditional Santa Lucia saffron buns, the same ones these seniors baked when they were kindergartners. Taking their cue from Santa Lucia, Norwegians, cozy in their homes, brighten their long, dark winters with lots of candles, white lights, you'll never see a colored one, and lots of greenery. In Norway, as in the rest of Europe, pagan symbols, like the evergreen tree, survive disguised as Christmas traditions. The same is true with this sprig of mistletoe. In Scandinavia, it's associated with the Viking goddess of love. For Celtic people, it was a sacred plant. They used it to heal the sick and enhance fertility. For most of us, it's just a handy excuse to steal a little Christmas kiss. <laughs> the Norwegian spirit of Christmas extends even to the departed. Candles flicker in graveyards as families remember lost loved ones. And all over Norway, communities gather together in churches just like this, as choirs kept Santa Lucia Day with a concert. So imagine if you're the cameraman. We're just a feisty little gorilla public television TV crew. There's three of us, me, the producer, Simon, and the cameraman, either Carl or Peter. And the cameraman has no um, opportunity to get a second take on these. Normally, we set it up and we have the control where you can say, sing it again so I can get other shots. Carl's up there with the camera anticipating where is everybody going and he's got to know where to stand and and the locals often don't understand how how time consuming it is to, sh to get a good shot and that the cameraman needs time so Carl's just on the fly and with this beautiful gathering in this beautiful small town Norwegian church suddenly they all proceed out of the church and symbolically bringing the light of the good news and God's love they pour out into the town and they gather on the main square and Carl just scampered and he got the whole thing and I just marvel at how he's thinking like an editor as he's shooting. And as the congregation follows the Santa Lucias out, more light of Christmas spills into this little fjordside community. common theme across cultures is a legendary gift giver, not always fat and jolly, who kids butter up with treats. While I grew up leaving Santa Claus milk and cookies by the fireplace, the kids here leave a bowl of porridge out by the barn for the Yulanisa. These mischievous elves from the forest visit each Christmas not on reindeer, but with a horse, pig, and mouse entourage, and a bag of gifts. Every good child knows the Yulanisa is coming with an exciting reward. Just up the fjord, Norway's capital, Oslo, celebrates Christmas with a more urban charm. Streets are decorated. Locals, not ready to rely on the Yulanissa, are out shopping. And good cheer is abundant. Christmas in Oslo feels low-key. You'll find it best not on the streets or in the malls, but in the homes, with friends, and in music. Youthful voices fill the city's oldest church. The old Acker Church, which dates back to the 12th century, hosts the Norwegian Girls' Choir for an Advent concert. You know, as I mentioned, I'm Norwegian. This is my souvenir from Norway. And um, I was determined to have Norway, uh, you know, in the mix here for this one-hour celebration of Christmas around Europe, along with France and Italy and Germany and England and so on. 
And I wanted to show a beautiful concert and the concert we had booked, it just was not going to work for TV. And then we just had one night to get this. So we hopped in our car and we looked at the tourist list of other concerts going on that evening. We tried another concert. It was just not going to work. And then I realized that on the edge of town in the oldest church in Oslo, the Akers Church, it's an old stone Romanesque church, the Norwegian Girls Choir, the National Girls Choir was singing an Advent concert and it was pouring down rain. And we dashed over there and it was like 20 minutes before concert time. We parked the car. I ran in and I found the conductor and I explained we're a TV crew from the United States. We'd love to be able to shoot the, the girls choir and include it in our, in our celebration of Christmases around Europe. And he said, okay. And we ran in and we set up. And just when we're done setting up, candle lit, the choir proceeds in and we got this and, uh, it's the ended up being on the cover of our, our CD for our favorite Christmas music. And just these are the moments that make this show a show that I'm so thankful for. This is the Girls Choir of Norway in the oldest church in Oslo, done on the fly. Thank you, Norwegian Girls Choir. I'll munch a krumkaka to that concert. Who's in talk, Norwegian Girls Choir? We'll check back with the Santa Lucias and the Yulanissa later. And while Norway awaits the return of the sun, further south, Paris creates its own light. Paris is nicknamed Europe's City of Light for its incandescent energy and effervescent culture. In the dark of winter, the city's best-loved icon, the Eiffel Tower, brilliantly heralds this happy season. By night, Paris's biggest department stores dress up the streets. Printemps is pretty in pink. And the Galerie Lafayette has woven an exquisite embroidery of lights. And all along the Champs-Élysées, it's a festive forest of 2,000 twinkling trees. By day, the signs of Christmas are more subtle, but can be found everywhere. The best-dressed trees are seen here, in the Pompidou Center. Where else but in Paris will you find avant-garde Christmas trees making a fashion statement? With visions of Versace dancing in their heads, inspired fashionistas can bundle up their wish lists and head to the designer boutiques on the Rue Royale. Christmas in Paris is elegantly understated, and the city yields unexpected moments. Turn a corner and you just might find yourself in a stylish arcade all wrapped up in red. Busy Parisian shoppers fuel up on the city's street food. Steamy crepes mm. and hot roasted chestnuts. Joyeux Noël. And neighborhood brasseries are full of friends, slurping fresh oysters rushed in from the Brittany coast. Oysters are favorites at Christmas, which makes perfect sense as they're plump and delicious this time of year. 
Tis also the season of elegant edibles. Foie gras, a pâté made from goose liver and a smidge of cognac, is especially popular during holidays. And chocolate shops and patisseries, wonderful any time of year, get even better at Christmas. There are chocolate chestnuts, yummy Yule logs, and delights fit for a king. Even sophisticated Paris rolls out the magic carpet for children. French families from all over the country rendezvous at the windows of the grand department stores. Displays are specially designed to enchant the little ones. And stools provided by thoughtful stores make sure that even the tiniest tot enjoys a good view. During Christmas, the Eiffel Tower becomes the highest ice skating rink in Paris. Kids ride ponies at Luxembourg Gardens. And the city's magical Ménage de Noël, the carousels of Christmas, spin memories. A clear, cold day brings out Parisians, trying to soak up as much sunlight as possible on these, the shortest days of the year, while a dusting of snow brings out hopes for a white Christmas, like at home. Whether you're young or just young at heart, Christmas in Paris is the stuff of dreams. If Paris is a grand dame strutting her Christmas finery, then Burgundy, where we're heading next, is her pious country cousin. Burgundy lies in the quiet, religious heart of this mostly secular nation. France's most venerable abbeys are here, and their spirit seems to animate the small villages throughout the region. Ancient traditions survive comfortably here. This 13th century abbey resonates with the rich sounds of the French group Fanima, singing medieval carols just as they were sung centuries ago. A sense of community runs strong in rural France, and it expresses itself in simple rituals shared by families and friends. In Burgundy, no one goes without. Communities take good care of one another year-round with special treats at Christmas. This amiable village mayor, accompanied by her entourage, gets into the spirit of things by delivering baskets of delicacies to the elderly for the Christmas Eve feast. On vient vous souhaiter un joyeux Noël. This morning, my friends, the Bertolutes, are shopping for seasonal fare at the Saturday market. <laughs> Fine foods at the center of life in Burgundy, even in the dead of winter. Right about now, the truffles are at their pungent best. <laughs> Delphine and Emmanuel prepare for the grandest culinary event of the year. The French call their Christmas Eve feast La Réveillon de Noël. On peut prendre une petite tranche, on va prendre une petite tranche. At home, the family's busy preparing for the big event. The children are decorating candles to set on the windowsill on Christmas Eve to light up the dark on that night so filled with anticipation. 
And the tree's not quite done until capped with a star. In the kitchen, Delphine slices her foie gras, then devotes herself to the centerpiece of the Revion, filet of beef wrapped in brioche. Stretching the pastry is a two-person job. After generously grating local truffles, the beef is tenderly wrapped and ready for the oven. And there's still the serious business of selecting the perfect wine from the cellar. Soon guests will be arriving. This time of year, when the days are short and the nights are long, it's customary to leave a welcoming light in the window. We'll be back when dinner's ready. But first, we've got some shopping to do in Germany. When it comes to traditional holiday images, Germany's Bavaria is the heartland. Here, we'll savor classic holiday themes, glittering trees, old-time carols, and colorful Christmas markets. These markets, called Chris Kindle Market. All right. Hey, it's time just for a little bit of a break here. I want to thank you once again for celebrating Christmas with us here around Europe. So far, we have visited England, Norway, and France. We're going next to, where are we going? We're going to go to Germany. We're going to go to Switzerland, and we're going to go to Italy. Lots more Christmas coming up. You know, when you think about what we've seen so far, it's just, of course, there's individual uh, traditions, but there's these universal delights. I mean, just the joy of children during the holiday time, making the figgy pudding, cutting down the Christmas trees, uh, you know, the, the kindergartners visiting the, the seniors in the uh, old folks home in Norway and bringing them those saffron buns. Uh, the mayor going out into the village with so French with wine and an accordion entourage and bringing goodies to the to the people who don't get out much anymore. There's so much love in this world. And, you know, that's my I guess that's my favorite thing about travel is I come home with a recognition that it's a sad person whose worldview is shaped by commercial news media, because then we just get fearful and we get frustrated by how many things are going wrong. When you travel, you see how many things are going right. And there's a lot of things going right. This world is filled with joy. It's filled with love. It's filled with beautiful people. How do I know? I've spent four months a year for the last 45 years checking it out. <laughs> and you are too. So thank you for traveling with us. Hey, I want to say uh, we can't do Monday Night Travel without our wonderful team. Julianne is moderating this evening and uh, Lisa is behind the scenes answering your questions and uh, making sure you're all figured out in the Q&A section. Uh, we've got Ben, we've got Gabe. It's our crew of four that makes Monday Night Travel happen every Monday night. We're coming up on our, I think this is like our 99th or 97th uh, edition of Monday Night Travel something like that. As Julianne mentioned, we're going to take a couple weeks off. And then on January 9th, I'm coming back and kicking off our European Travel Festival. It is 22 nights in a row of European fun right here. Six o'clock every night for 22 nights, starting on January 9th. It's free. You need to get your name on the list so you can register. And uh, we hope that you will be able to scout through the um, schedule and visit the countries that you're interested in as we think of putting our travel dreams into smooth and affordable reality. I also want to remind you that in the chat section there, my staff has put together links of anything that might be of interest to you after watching this show. So uh, check out the chat section. If you have any questions, uh, put them in the Q&A section there, and Julianne will make sure that we get to them after we finish off with our Christmas celebration. I've already had one of my Nurnberger sausages and I've got one more. And these are the little sausages, the size of your little finger with some scent, some mustard and little buns. You'll find them in Nürn all over Germany, but in Nuremberg especially. And that's where we're going right now. Germany is famous for its Christmas markets and the granddaddy of all those markets. And I've seen a lot of them. To me, my very favorite is in Nuremberg. And now you're going to see why. Let's go to Germany for a little bit of Freya Weihnachten. It's alive in squares throughout Germany. The most famous is here in Nuremberg. 
It's a festive swirl of the heartwarming sights, sounds, and smells of Christmas. Long a center of toy making in Germany, a woody and traditional ambiance prevails. Nutcrackers are characters of authority, uniformed, strong jawed, and able to crack the tough nuts. I don't know if you noticed, but we lip synced that just there. The Nutcracker was moving his jaw perfectly with my voice. Smokers, with their fragrant incense wafting, feature common folk like this village toy maker. Prune people, with their fig body, walnut head, and prune limbs, are dolled up in Bavarian folk costumes. And hovering above it all is the golden Rausch Angel, an icon of Christmas in Nuremberg. Rausch is the sound of wind blowing through its wings. It's a favorite for capping family Christmas trees. Bakeries crank out old-fashioned gingerbread, the Leibkuchen Nuremberg, using the original 17th century recipe. Back then, Nuremberg was the gingerbread capital of the world, and its love affair with gingerbread lives on. Shoppers can also munch the famous Nuremberg breakfast, skinny as your little finger, and sip hot spiced wine. As in so many cultures, kids love their local version of Santa Claus. While Santa is a legend, his character is based on Saint Nicholas a kind and generous bishop who actually lived in Turkey in the fourth century. Holiday gift-giving, especially in Catholic regions, is often associated with the feast day of St. Nicholas, December 6. But Germany is Luther country. Back in the early 1500s, the great reformer Martin Luther wanted to humanize the Christmas story by shifting the focus away from the saints and back onto the birthday boy, Jesus. Rather than jolly old Saint Nick bringing the goodies on December 6th, Luther established the idea that gifts would be given on the 25th by the Christ child, or in German, Christkind. But for kids, it was hard to imagine the little baby in the manger delivering gifts. So an angel served as the gift-giving Christ child. And somehow, the angel came to be represented by a young girl. She spends her reign spreading the joy of the season. The Christkind concludes by telling the enthralled children, if you're very, very gentle, you can touch my wings. Nuremberg's favorite angel then leads her fans into the children's section of the market, where expertly bundled kids enjoy a Christmas wonderland. I got to say, I, she's like, uh, the Christkind is like some queen of Christmas in Bavaria. And uh, she's so angelic. And uh, when she says, if you're very careful, you can touch my wings, the kids just go crazy. And she's actually got paparazzi. We were sort of like with a whole bunch of, of media that was there tracking her around town. And I actually had 15 minutes in uh, her green room to interview her with the cameras rolling. And that uh, didn't make it into the TV show, of course, but it's one of the little DVD extras. And uh, when you go to ricksteves.com, if you look in the TV section, look up the Christmas show under specials, and then you will see DVD extras there. And you can sit down with me and ask the Chris Kind some questions. Questions. Now we cross the border into Austria to the town that to me always feels like Christmas, Salzburg. With its old town gathered under its formidable castle, Salzburg celebrates the holidays with an alpine elegance. Christmassy shopping lanes delight browsers. Markets are busy as shoppers gather last minute holiday decorations and perhaps a fresh sprig of mistletoe. These Tyrolians celebrate the season in noisier fashions as well. From the castle ramparts high above town, Traditional gunners fire away as they have since the days when they really believed these shots would scare away evil spirits. Salzburg, nicknamed the Rome of the North, has a magnificent cathedral, inspired by St. Peter's at the Vatican. 
Locals here in the town of Mozart pack the place to mix worship with glorious music. And you just, excuse me for interrupting this amazing music, but the whole back of the church is a wall of sound. You've got the choir, you've got the small orchestra, you've got the glorious pipes, you've got that heritage, and it's all in a church that is sort of based on the plan of St. Peter's, but one quarter scale. This is the most magnificent place to be for a Christmas mass because it's a grand concert as well as a beautiful celebration. It was here in the region of Salzburg that the most loved carol of the Christmas season, Silent Night, was sung for the first time nearly 200 years ago. Mm. According to legend, the local priest went out one Christmas night to bless a newborn baby. As he walked home in the snow, he was so moved by the stillness of the starlit and holy night that he wrote a poem about it. He gave the poem to Franz Gruber, the organist in his church, who composed a simple tune. On Christmas Eve, 1818, the carol was sung for the first time, accompanied only by a guitar. Austria is one of Europe's more traditional corners. Its strong Catholicism and a love of heritage shine especially brightly at Christmas time in the countryside. There you go. Man, that was fun to be on a horse-drawn sleigh. That was one of the treats for me. Uh, I was also a nervous wreck because everything was going slow and it was going to be pitch black in about 20 minutes. And we only had this little window to get the, look at how beautiful that shot is. But that is really amped up as it's almost too dark to get a video of it, but it's just really complicated to turn the sled around with the horses and to get them going. And uh, somehow we got that. And then we came into this beautiful family's country farmhouse home. And it was the family of one of my guides that we go to in uh, Salzburg, Christian. Schneeweiss, and uh, she opened up her house to us, and it was just a beautiful opportunity to see these sacred traditions handed down, not just through the generations, but through the centuries. And you know, when we're doing a show like this, we know we wanted to get a dinner with a family to show traditions of Christmas in this part of Europe, either in Bavaria or in the Tyrol in Austria. And we actually created two Christmas dinners, and it wasn't even Christmas yet, so the kids were all confused. They celebrated Christmas like five days before they were supposed to, and then they celebrated again later, but these crazy guys from the United States paid for the moose dinner and all the Christmas decorations, and uh, we just had the party. We did it in Nuremberg, and the family was they tried, but it was it was kind of like the Adams family. It just there was no charm to it, really. And um, we then went to uh, Austria in Salzburg, and the Schneeweiss family was just perfect. So now we're gonna meet the family in Tyrol in Austria, and we're gonna go back in time to this most beautiful country Christmas in Austria. <laughs> We're visiting the Weissacher family farm. Frohe Weihnachten. Kommt herein, bitte. Okay. This family happily shares its love of the season with a guest. Like just about anywhere, part of Christmas is making cookies with Grandma. Guess what you're doing this So, More unique to Austria is this ritual 
in which the dad blesses the home with incense as his daughter follows with holy water. The prayer is for a healthy and happy new year. Maria teaches her daughters how the Advent wreath marks the four weeks of Advent, the season of preparation leading to the Advent, or arrival, of Jesus. Ancient peoples were the first wreath makers. For Christians, that evergreen circle came to symbolize everlasting life. The candles, one for each week, reminded them that the birth of their Savior was approaching. Austrians lovingly decorate their tree but keep it secret and hidden from the children until December 24th arrives. We'll check back a little later to see what Christmas brings. Hello. From here in the Alps, we journey to a grand city that was the capital of the Western world on that first Christmas 2,000 years ago and remains a leading city in Christendom today. Rome, this is home of the Vatican City headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church and some of Europe's most sacred Christmas traditions. For centuries, pilgrims have hiked from all over Christendom to this great city. Domes and ancient obelisks still serve as markers lacing together relics and sacred stops, including the tomb of St. Peter, marked by the greatest dome anywhere. And through the ages, pilgrims have stopped here at the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore. The faithful believe the original planks from Jesus' crib are in this ornate container. And here, in the capital of Catholicism, each Christmas, lovingly constructed manger scenes called Presepi pop up all over town. St. Francis of Assisi is credited with assembling the first manger scene in 1223. He used it as a tool to teach people the story of the first Christmas. Since then, in the creative teaching style of St. Francis, manger scenes often put Bethlehem in a local context. Instead of the Middle East, Italians have long set the Holy Family right here, in Italian settings. St. Francis knew that by putting Jesus in a place people would recognize, their own neighborhood, the faithful could relate more easily to the story of his birth. and Presepi range from the very traditional to the very surprising, like this one that imagines the nativity in an Eskimo village. The ultimate manger scene is back on Rome's ultimate square. St. Peter's is where the Pope celebrates midnight mass each Christmas Eve. For Roman families, there are more than just manger scenes to see. For centuries, this lively square, Piazza Navona, has hosted a boisterous village-like holiday market that stays busy until Epiphany in January. The Christmas season in Europe stretches for well over a month, not to maximize shopping days, but to fit in the season's many holy days. Advent starts four Sundays before Christmas Eve. Then comes the Feast of St. Nicholas on December 6th. Santa Lucia Day is on the 13th, and Europeans don't wrap things up on the 25th. The 12 days of Christmas stretch from the 25th through January 6th. That's Epiphany, the day the three kings finally delivered the gifts. If you ever making a TV show and you wish you were in Rome for an on-camera, but you're in Austria, go to Salzburg, because there's plenty of angles that make it look like you're in Rome, like right here in front of the cathedral in Austria. Salzburg, which, as I mentioned, is based on the cathedral or the basilica at the Vatican, but one quarter scale. In Italy, on Epiphany, La Bufana, a popular Christmas witch, flies over the rooftops, filling children's stocking with candy or coal. Between visiting their manger scenes and Christmas witches, many Italians are shopping for their big Christmas Eve dinner. When it comes to a festa, Italians like to buy fresh and local, and lucky Romans enjoy an abundance of farmers' markets. La Vigilia, the traditional Christmas Eve dinner, calls for all the trimmings. Here in Rome, that's lots of veggies and a nice big female eel. As anywhere, Christmas in Rome is a time of giving. 
So this is the beautiful church, Santa Maria in Trastevere. And all of us travelers, when we go to Trastevere, this is the main square with the main church. That's one of the oldest churches in Rome. It's on the other side of the Tiber River, Trastevere. And it's where people were more free to re worship before Christianity was legal, uh, because it was outside of the town walls, outside of the center of Rome. Uh, we go into this church generally as sightseers, but during Christmas time, you realize, wow, this church has a mission in its community, and they invite all of the hungry people in the community, all of the needy people in the community in for a grand feast. And it's so great to be remembering that when we, while well, we visit a lot of these churches, like they're just um, sightseeing attractions, they're also functioning churches uh, with a mission to take care of their neighbors. The spirit of charity is especially alive in this neighborhood, which has come together for a special holiday meal at the church of Santa Maria in Trastevere. Tables have replaced pews, and the poor are enjoying a feast prepared and served by the community. It's a joyful occasion, and by all accounts, those doing the giving feel as blessed as those they feed. Outside of Rome, in villages in regions such as Tuscany, Christmas celebrations are a little more rustic. The festivities, while low-key, are memorable. During a busy season that sometimes feels overwhelming, village life can be refreshingly simple. These jovial friends are playing an old game. The idea is to toss the pan forte, the local fruitcake, close to the edge of the table without having it slide off. Okay, that's the pan forte, but this is a panatone, and they're two different fruitcakes. And this is a lighter one, and this is the Christmas favorite. And you slice it up, and you toast it up, and you put some butter on it, and you can call it dessert. You can call it breakfast. You can call it a Merry Christmas. Mmm. Oh, man. If you've always hated fruitcake, go to Italy. You can toss it around and play that game, or you can just sit down and eat a panatone. These children are flip-flopping the gift-giving tradition. They're delivering another Christmas treat, panettone, a rich brioche made with raisins and citrus, to older folks who have no family nearby. While providing a bright spot in this grandma's day, the child experiences the joy of giving. And today, the children have another important errand. It's time to post their letters to Babbo Natale, the Italian version of Santa Claus. This special mailbox mysteriously appears each Christmas. Sacred music and prayer infuse this tranquil landscape. Here at the 15th century Abbey of Monte Oliveto Maggiore, mm. reclusive monks celebrate their faith in a timeless fashion, as if one with the communities they serve. And in this town, the people are doing a dress rehearsal for a presepio vivente, or living nativity. On Christmas Eve, in this simple cloister, mm. they'll recreate the town of Bethlehem on that mm. holiest of nights. Mm. In the countryside, you'll appreciate how sacred traditions have deep roots. 
Here in this medieval Tuscan hill town, villagers stack neat pyramids of wood for great bonfires. The lighting of the fires is a signal to villagers dressed as shepherds to come and sing old carols. It's a reminder that through the ages, Italy's humble shepherds entertained the faithful as they gathered by fires to warm themselves and await the arrival of Christmas. Well, Italy has the rich history, magnificent manger scenes and grand churches. The spirit of Christmas can be experienced everywhere in Europe. High in Switzerland, where the churches are small and villages huddle below towering peaks, the mighty Alps seem to shout the glory of God. Up here, Christmas fills a wintry wonderland with good cheer. Ah, ah, what great memories. I was just in Switzerland just a couple months ago, and we're in the same village. And uh, every time I go to Gimmelwald, I remember the great time we had filming this show. And, um, you know, Ollie is my friend who is the only, the, the school teacher there. He and Maria share that one teaching post in town. It's like a one-room schoolhouse in this little village. And Ollie is my fixer. Whenever I come to town with the TV crew and I need something done, Ollie takes care of it. Ollie, uh, uh, you know, my dream was to find a, a man, a little man that looked like a troll chopping small wood for small stoves. Ollie found the perfect troll chopping small wood. You'll see that in just a minute. The wood has to be small because their stoves are small. Uh, I wanted to, to, to go down the mountain on a wooden bicycle. They have bicycle, a wooden bicycle on skis. It's a really cool thing that I haven't seen anywhere except in Switzerland. And I asked Ollie to find us the perfect tree way up into the mountains. So we all put on our snowshoes and we tromped up there. And then we had uh, fondue in a, in a little mountain hut with condensation on the windows that sort of symbolized the conviviality that was just rich and bubbling inside. And you'll learn about that special, that special Swiss sort of charm and conviviality high in the mountains. You'll have your Heidi Coco and Heidi Coco is a hot chocolate with your peppermint schnapps. And uh, when I think of Heidi Coco, <laughs> I think of, we just made that name up and it's stuck in Gimmelwald. There's uh, I don't know what the name is in German, but uh, Walter, who runs the best hotel, best, bless his heart, he passed away. But uh, mm. Walter and I used to make hot chop chocolate with the uh, peppermint stops. We called it a Heidi Coco. Everybody bought it. And I didn't even get a cut of all of his sales. But we were having a great time high in the Alps. So right now, we're going to have some good times for Christmas high in the Alps. My family's flying over from Seattle and it snowed. It's the only snow we saw on this whole shoot. And we didn't have snow a week before, but the day we arrived, so did the snow in Switzerland. I swear, to answer to a prayer, this show would not have been right without a little snow, and we got it here. Let's go now to the Swiss Alps. Gimmelwald, my favorite little village. Thanks to Ollie and Maria, our friends in Gimmelwald. In these villages, traditions are strong. And warmth is a priority. Ovens are small, so wood is too. My family has arrived for a Swiss Alps Christmas. Along with our kids, Andy and Jackie, my wife Anne has joined me here in the tiny village of Gimmelbach. Where we're having some fun with our friends Ollie and Maria and their kids. Ollie's taking us high above his village on a quest to find and cut the perfect Christmas tree. <laughs> what do you think? I like your line, Ollie. Yeah, this is a good tree. I think we should cut it. Oh, 
still high above Gimmelwald, we're stopping in a hut for a little fondue. We've got the tree. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was quite a bit of work. Mm. This feels just right in the winter, oh, doesn't so it? Good. When it's cold mm. outside, you know, it's perfect. <laughs> Fico Gaggle means um, fondue is good, ukita kuti luna, and it, it's, um, it means in English um, fondue is delicious and gives a good mood. So if you have a party, you know that it's going to be. Yes, everybody knows what Fico Gaggle means. If there's, if there's yes. fondue, it'll be a good ambience. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible not to linger in this cozy setting. Before we know it, that's one of my, this is the photograph I really wanted to get. Looking through the window with the condensation on it, just to see the smiles and the figo gecko. When you eat fondue, you know it's going to be a good time. Light outside begins to fade. So now, when, this, when you're making a TV show, when the sun goes down, you've got this window, this twilight, and it does not last very long. And in half an hour, it's going to be too dark to film. And we've got one cameraman, we've got a big cast, and we got to go all the way down the mountain. So you can imagine the chaos with our torches, with the sun going down, with our sleds and our little wooden bicycles with skis, and the cameraman loping ahead of us and then saying, okay, go. And we scream by him, and then he stops, and he runs down, and he gets us again. And then we got the torches going into the distance, and I swear, Steve, our editor, cranked up the giggles and the laughter as we sledded out into the twilight with our torches and our Christmas joy. Join us now as we sled down the mountains on one of my favorite little bits we've ever captured on video and brought home thanks to public television. Happy Christmas. Yeah. Woo. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. As the sun sets, we've got our tree and take an unforgettable ride home to Gimmelbaum. Back in the village, the kids take the tree home, and we've been invited to enjoy another Christmas tradition. While I grew up opening windows on a paper advent calendar, up here, the windows are real. 25 homes decorate a window for each day of Advent. The sense of anticipation is the same as day by day Christmas approaches. Advent is all about anticipation. And for the kids, much of that anticipation is about presents, rewards for being not naughty, but nice. And as we've seen throughout Europe, each culture seems to have its own version of Santa Claus, who serves parents by providing children incentives for good behavior. Here in the Alps, it's Sami Klaus, that's Swiss German for Saint Nicholas, and his sidekick, Smoochli. My son, Andy, is playing Sami Klaus this year. Ollie's son, Sven, is playing Smoochli, and the donkey is playing himself. Each year, Kimmelwald's children anticipate a visit from this dynamic Christmas duo. Sami Klaus surprises the children and checks in his ledger to see if they've been doing their chores. Have you been feeding the cows lately? Then he might ask for a song or a poem. Sing. What would you like to sing? Take me tight and sick it. I need near this house. Get out fallen wicked. Me don't sign on dolls. And the performance is always followed by a treat oh, from good. his big bag of gifts. Well, hope you have a Merry Christmas. Frohe Weihnachten. See you next year. Adia. Bye. <laughs> Mission accomplished, and it's time for dinner. Back home, Grandma and Grandpa have joined the gang as we settle into a classic Swiss Christmas Eve. After dinner, both our families gather in the living room. Lighting the candles is a treat our children will always remember. He 
geschah zur Zeit, dass Virenius... Three generations come together as Grandpa reads from the old family Bible. Jedermann ging, dass er sich schätzen ließe. Grandpa, I found out later, actually grew the beard for the shoot. He knew we were coming and he grew his big white beard. And something I just really wanted was Grandpa reading the old family Bible, the old Luther Bible, this uh, family treasure with his granddaughter looking on and his hands, his weathered hands on the old pages. Ein jeglicher in seine Stadt. Da machte sich auch auf Josef aus Galiläa, aus der Stadt Nazareth, in das jüdische Land, zur Stadt David, die da heißt Bethlehem. The evenings capped off with the sharing of gifts. <laughs> Christmas Eve is finally here, and right about now, all across Europe, our friends are celebrating this long anticipated night in their own unique ways. So this is the time we've been sort of teasing all through the show. And this is where those kids in Austria get to discover the tree that they've not yet been able to see. This is the time when those manger scenes with a crib, but with no baby Jesus, Jesus comes to the crib. This is the time we're at the midnight mass at St. Peter's Basilica. And it's John Paul II's last mass. Now passed away, of course, and now St. John Paul II. And this is the time we've been capturing bells ringing and people saying, good Yule, Merry Christmas, Bon Natale, in every different language. We've been collecting that. And my crew edits it all together in a beautiful European Christmas finale. Enjoy this. Down the chimney, St. Nicholas came with a bound. In England, the family snuggles together, anticipating the arrival of Father Christmas. A little old driver, so light. Up in Norway, they're joining hands in song. In Burgundy, a toast starts the Revion, and Delphine's beef is finally done. In Austria, the children discover what their grandparents have been hiding from them. Final touches are made to the Bethlehem being created in Tuscany. And at the Vatican, people pack St. Peter's as millions around the world share a sacred and glorious midnight mass. And as Christmas Day dawns, a joyful chorus heralds the birth of Jesus. Happy Christmas. Joyeux Noël. Johnny Vianachte. Buon Natale a tutti. Guyel. Merry Christmas. Frohe Weihnachten. Joyeux Noël. Happy
Happy Christmas! Ho, ho, ho! Frohe Weihnachten! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! I wish you all a very Merry Christmas! Oh, my goodness. Julianne, that is quite a travel festival. Yes, I got chills at the end with the, I think, Carol the Bells playing. <laughs> you know, it just feels like we we became friends of all those people, <laughs> all those families. Man, oh, man, I'm, I'm particularly caught up and emotional in it now because I was just holding our little grandchild in my arms a couple of days ago and to see all that. Just all that beautiful family love and that joy is just a beautiful thing, isn't it? It is. Ah, that was nice. Hey, um, I think we've probably got some questions. We do have some wonderful questions, but first we have a word from our sponsor. A word from our sponsor. Well, yes, I'd, I'd love to have a word from our sponsor. Um, I want to remind people that we're going to uh, take a couple of uh, days off or a couple of weeks off. And then on uh, January 9th, we're coming back. And if people want to enjoy our Festival of Europe, whether you're taking a tour, if you're thinking a tour or just going on your own, we're going to be on, it's going to be like Monday night travel for 22 nights in a row. If you go to ricksteves.com here, you can look at Monday night travel and you can just click like those who sign up for Monday night travel do. And you'll find at the top, it says Festival of Europe. And you can just click on Festival of Europe and you can get there through our tour section also. And here you will see every night from July, January 9, 10, 11, England, 12, Spain, 13, Scandinavia, 14, Switzerland, on and on and on. And every Monday is sort of a special little party. And then every other day of the week, we've got guides coming in and celebrating our tour program. Uh, normally, we'd have people all flying into Seattle, but because of uh, the pandemic and all that sort of thing, we've decided let's just do it virtually. And we're actually able to accommodate a lot more people's needs and nobody needs to fly all the way to Seattle for this. So that is going to be a lot of fun. Also, I want to remind you that um, uh, the uh, I mentioned our fundraiser. If you are inclined to make a special, make your Christmas a little extra dimension of, of love and the Christmas spirit, and you're looking for a very clever gift. Uh, if you go to ricksteves.com, right on the front page, you'll see this. It says the Bread for the World fundraiser. And if you click on that, it's explained how I'm matching the first 5,000 people who give $100. So my hope is that 5,000 people will join us with a $100 gift. That's a half a million dollars for Bread for the World. I will match it like I do every year, and we will be able to empower Bread for the World's work with a million dollars. And, you know, I've been a member, a supporting member of Bread for the World for 30 years now. And when I want to make a charitable contribution to some organization in the interest of fighting hunger, both at home and abroad, for me, it is so clear that Bread for the World is the place that leverages my philanthropic giving better than any other organization. There's lots of good organizations. But if you'd like to learn more about this, just check that out. And maybe you want to get on board with us. We're a little bit behind our pace last year. We've got about um, 2,800 people, I believe, that have given so far. And I'd love to get that up a little more so we can get to our million dollar level. So that is... Um, I guess that's what a word from our sponsor is. If you'd like to join us for the uh, Bread for the World fundraiser, you know how to do it. And I'm just really gearing up for just the next couple of days. I'll be doing a little pre-recording with some great little, just fun, entertaining bits with our guides in Europe. And we're putting together an amazing festival. Again, 22 nights in a row at ricksteves.com. Just sign up. And it's like um, Monday night travel every night of the week. If you, uh, if you like traveling, you can pick and choose which dates you want to go and join us. It'll be a lot of fun. Okay, let's check out some of our questions, Julianne. Well, our first question is from Peppa. And she mentioned how the Christmas show that we watched tonight has become a staple for many families across the U.S. And she wondered, did you expect the Christmas show to have so much success? Um. I had no idea it would have that success. What I wanted it to do was being aired, you know, like everywhere for one Christmas and uh, stations run it every year and they don't run it just because they like Christmas or that they like me. They run it because people watch it. And I was just marveling at how much joy I was getting out of watching. I haven't seen it for a year. <laughs> 
And I think you were too, Julian. It was just so much fun, so much culture, so much tradition, so much just joy. I I, I sound almost syrupy or soupy or, or or you know just just over the top, but it might be my my Heidi Coco. I don't know, but <laughs> I didn't expect that. Now we did a show that I think is just as good on Easter. And it didn't get anywhere near the traction of our Christmas show. I think it's just easier to be a crowd pleaser with Christmas. But the Easter show is really great. And um, uh, they still run that all over the country. Uh, and a lot of people ask if I would do it again, you know, do the um, Christmas show again. And everything went so right on that shoot that we just did there. I don't think I could, I, even though it's an old show now, I don't think I could do but I, I say that in a lot of cases, and I go over there, and we managed to do pretty pretty well. But you know, we did all the the major countries. We could have gone to Spain, you know, we could have gone to Poland, we could have gone to Scotland, we could have gone to Greece, and put together a Christmas. Actually, that sounds pretty good to me right now. Put, <laughs> you can do a, do a show like that. But um, my kids are uh, wonderful kids, but they're no nowhere near as cute, uh, and neither am I. So uh, I think we're just going to go with this uh, European Christmas there. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And I think we might all know the answer to this because it might be everyone's favorite part of the show. But Kathy asks, which location did you enjoy filming the most? Well, remember, I was only in three locations. So mm -hmm. I was only in Norway, uh, Germany, Austria and Switzerland. And the second crew was in France, England and Italy. And I didn't want to interrupt the show by by pointing that out. But if you look at it really carefully, you can see I, I do a couple of on cameras in the in the countries I wasn't actually at. And I was so thankful for the work that Simon's wife, Val, uh, is a great producer. And she's helped us out in a number of special shoots uh, when we have two crews. And she's just masterful. And they worked so hard to get all that great footage. And Simon and I were thrilled with the footage the second crew brought home. Um, but which did I enjoy the most? I was nervous in Norway because Norway is a pretty secular place and uh, the weather was just rainy and it just was didn't feel very, very Christmassy like in Salzburg or, or, or like uh, in, in Nuremberg or like in the Tuscany villages. Uh, but um, then we got that beautiful music and we got that beautiful scene in the old folks home with the little kids and, and the older people. And uh, it worked very well. But I got to say, I was nervous in Norway because I really wanted it to do good. And, and it was more difficult than other countries. Um, I enjoyed the Swiss Alps so much. I love working with Ollie. Uh, my family flew over just for three days to be there. And we got that snow and everything went great. And I was so thankful. That was that was Christmas. Although we went to the place where Silent Night was written, o Oberdorf, I think is the name of the town. And it was a mud fest. It was just pouring down rain and it was just miserable. And <laughs> it was impossible. So we didn't get anything in that town. But, you know, when you're shooting, some things work out and some things don't. And you see what you get and you release it all together. And God willing, you have enough to make a show. <laughs> I just noticed in this time watching that to get to the tree in Switzerland, you had to tromp through so much snow, which looked, was it exhausting to get through all well, that snow to the tree? You know, I wasn't going to tell you, but um, we had to <laughs> tromp through all that snow. And it's the only time in my life I've ever been in snowshoes. Uh, but Ollie actually had gone up the day before and he had cut the tree. He knew which tree we were going to have. And it was up there and it was just, and he pretended like we we're going to look for it. And he found, yeah, this is the perfect tree. And then all of a sudden it's down and it's on the sled. If you look at it, when it sits on the sled, you can see it was perfectly cut and it has a day's worth of snow packed onto the, the little perfectly cut end of it. But uh, that was, uh, Ollie was doing his uh, scouting work ahead for us. <laughs> I was just nervous because the sun was going down and I wanted to get that figgle gecko with the, with the uh, fondue. You know, it drives me nuts when tourists eat Swiss fondue in the summer because no Swiss person would ever have fondue in the summer. It just stinks up your clothes, and you're supposed to you're supposed to have it in the winter. But in the dead of winter, up in the mountains, in a little chalet with dear friends and family, boy, that's a good time to have your cheese fondue. Brent, of course, noticed your beautiful tree in the background, and he was wondering, do you have any special Christmas ornaments on your tree? I've got so many special <laughs> ornaments on that tree, and it's just too presumptuous to take you on a tour of my ornaments. But for me, if somebody came in and, and brought me a whole set of 24 beautiful uniform bulbs, I would have a very hard time um, graciously accepting that. You know, um, I like each ornament to have a story. And I've got stories here of Christmases in Nicaragua back in the Sandinista days. I've got ornaments, my 
grandparents who came over from Norway had on their tree. And uh, I've got um, Christmas ornaments from Cuba, uh, you know, with Castro and uh, and uh, Che Guevara. And I've got I've got uh, some uh, some ornaments that oh, Germany is just great for Christmas ornaments. If anybody's ever gone to Rotenburg, they've gone to the little Christmas shops there and gotten their ornaments and uh, ornaments our children made and uh, some lace that was made in uh, Burano in, in Venice, beautiful uh, butterfly uh, on the, uh, my butterfly, you can see it up, up there below, just, just above my head right now. Do you see the butterfly there? Yes. Um, <laughs> Shelly, Shelly, half of the ornaments are Shelly's now. So she gets to put the angel on top. That's her. <laughs> And my butterfly is now on the second branch down, <laughs> but they're both beautiful, beautiful uh, lace. I love lace on a Christmas tree. Let's see. It was really wonderful to see all the children this evening in the show, just because they do bring such a joy and kind of innocence to Christmas. And Jackie mm -hmm. was wondering, what steps do you think we can take to have a more meaningful and less commercialized Christmas? You know, that's one reason I wanted to make this show is because in, in Europe, they don't say how many shopping days left till Christmas, you know, how many shopping days left till Christmas. It's quality time with the family. That's what it is. It's, it's taking care of your seniors. It's, uh, it's, it's embracing traditions. It's whether it's, you know, for some people it's sacred and for others, it's just family time, but it's not so fill in the blanks commercial, you know, um, in the United States, commercial rules and it's getting more ramped up and more desperate and it's um i'm so inspired by by the by the meaningful uh approach to the holidays that you find in europe compared to the commercial orgy that we have here um and you you get those traditions and and people caroling i mean people singing songs together uh and it's we all need to do that i just had i just had 20 people around my piano last night singing carols it was wonderful and as we sang last night, it occurred to me, these friends are hungry for caroling. We don't carol as much anymore. You know, we're, we're over in the mall shopping. How many shopping days till Christmas? So I just get off my little, um, you know, my little uh, platform there. But um, I know people buy books about how to unplug Christmas or how to take the stress out of Christmas. You don't need a book. You just need to put your foot down and say enough of the commercial stuff. Let's just not be complicated and let's have quality time together. That's to me what it's all about. And speaking of music, I think the music is one of the reasons the show is so fantastic, all the live choirs and everything. And June was wondering, we heard a lot of beautiful music in the show tonight. What is your favorite Christmas song? My favorite Christmas song. I think, uh, believe it or not, Santa Baby. <laughs> <laughs> Santa baby <laughs> and and O Come O Come Emmanuel. I love O Come O Come Emmanuel. But you know, we made this this CD here uh, with all my favorite pieces from Europe, and there's gorgeous songs that were in Europe, and they're all as catchy as our favorite carols, but they're different, and that's what I love putting this together because of um, rights issues and everything. I can't just stream this. If I I've just every year I ask my staff, can't we just let this be on our website? But but I'm glad music, musicians have that protection, but we have the rights to have this CD and it's for sale on our website, I believe. But anybody who is donating hundred dollars to bread for the world is donating $200 to bread for the world. Cause I'm going to pay hundred also, and you get a gift. And the gift is my favorite 20 carols that I love this. I play it. It's the first music I play when Christmas arrives every year. Uh, the uh, DVD set, which has uh, DVD extras and so on. And this wonderful book. I learned so much about Christmas when we were working that I couldn't begin to put in the TV show. And this has all of the uh, recipes of everything we ate in the show. And you don't even need to get the book for that. If you go to the, uh, ricksteves.com and you look in the TV section, you've got all the little DVD extras and you've got all the recipes right there. But if you'd like this uh, sort of Christmas gift pack, that's the three pack that comes with any donation to bread for the world during this fundraiser but the music really was important for this this production and uh, i was really thankful for that and kind of a funny question but quite a few people asked you had a lot of delicious food tonight mary ellen amongst others was wondering where do you buy your nuremberger sausages <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's not a Nuremberger sausage. It's a stupid breakfast sausage ah. that you can. So I'm just faking it. I just can't lie. I. <laughs> It's just a lousy Jimmy Dean or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> but but and it's nowhere near as good as a Nuremberger sausage. So you you caught me. Yeah. Oh. But um I look all over for a Nuremberger sausage and I couldn't find any. <laughs> In Germany, <laughs> they're everywhere and they are so good. So when you go to Germany, just look for the Nuremberger sausages. They're all over. You know, you've got Frankfurt sausages, you got Vienna sausages. I mean, wiener, think about it. Um, and you've got um, your Nuremberger sausages. And I just, I'm a, I'm a sucker for, no offense, Jimmy Dean or whoever sausages. <laughs> I like you too, but at Christmas, I want my Nuremberger sausage. <laughs> the truth revealed. <laughs> you caught me. <laughs> Let's see. Susan wondered if you could bring one European Christmas tradition home with you, which would you choose? Well, there's something magic about the little kids not seeing the tree until Christmas Day. I don't know how they pull that off, but they don't see the tree until Christmas Day or Christmas Eve. And then they open the door and there's this wonder of that, which is a beautiful thing. That's just a real beautiful thing. I like the fact that they celebrate different days in the Christmas season. As I mentioned, uh, Santa Lucia is big in Scandinavia. And it goes all the way to Epiphany. You know, the, you know, on the 12th day of Christmas, that's when the wise men uh, apparently brought the kind of got the, the gifts to the Christ child. And that was 12 days after Christmas, Epiphany, June or January 6th. So what I like in Europe is they celebrate a number of days related to the Christmas season. And there's a whole calendar, which um, is, um, it just makes the season uh, a little more multidimensional, I think. Well, can we have a cheers for everyone at home, Rick, before I get to the last question? Hey, Julianne, thank you so much. And, and Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to everybody. We really are thankful that you are part of our traveling family. And I am really thankful for a Heidi Coco. Remember, <laughs> Heidi Coco makes things go better. Very true. And our last question, as Christmas approaches this weekend, do you have just a final holiday message for our viewers? Well, it's my prayer that there can be meaning in our Christmas together, um, you know, regardless of your faith, regardless of, you know, what culture you're from, there's something fundamental, you know, if, if you believe there's a God or some sort of a big creator, we are all brothers and sisters. We're all children of God. And uh, to me, that's pretty universal. And uh, when we travel, we get to know the family. And uh, when we get to know the family, this world's a better place. So here's to getting to know the family and finding peace, peace, peace and justice. That's what I pray for yeah, this Christmas. Thank you very much, Julianne, for hosting. And we want to thank you all for joining us. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. And uh, enjoy a break. And I know you'll, <laughs> you'll miss us terribly, but we'll be back on January 9th. Thanks. Good night, Julianne. Good night, Rick. Good night, everyone. Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm.